So thank you all so much for being here for today's talk. Um, this is part of a symposium to co coincide with the launch of You Say You Love Me But You Don't Even Know Me, the exhibition here in the Little Museum of Dublin. Now, this is a project we're producing in partnership with the National Museums NI and is being made possible through generous support from the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Esme Mitchell Trust. So my guests now today, I've got the Chief Executive of the National Museums NI, Catherine Thompson. I've got the Director of Collections, William Blair, and then the Head of Curatorial, Hannah Crowdy. Thank you so much for being here. So Catherine, I'm going to ask you to start by just contextualising the exhibition and telling me a little bit about the National Museums of NI and your mission. Okay, well, um, it's, it's also great to be at an in-person event. It uh, feels a lot more normal to be back uh, out and about again. So we're thrilled to be here and we're thrilled to have the opportunity to bring this selection of objects down to the exhibition that we're opening uh, or that you're opening here today. I suppose um, Trevor and I, I've known Trevor quite a while and he said, I've got this great idea, do you think that would work? And I said, I've no idea, talk to my colleagues because they will be able to make these things happen. And uh, I, I suppose that's where this exhibition was born from. And I think that um, as, as both of the Lord Mayors have said earlier today, there, we have a very complex history on this island. And I think that we are, we are ill understood. Um, even within Northern Ireland, we don't all understand each other. Um, and certainly across the island, we probably don't all understand each other. And I think this is an opportunity. And I think what we do, particularly within museums, is that we provide a space for people to uh, challenge their perceptions, to uh, build their understanding and to, um, and to debate and discuss difficult questions. So what we really hope this exhibition will do is to provide a new perspective on Northern Ireland to people that come, but also that it uh, maybe asks questions and makes people think about things they hadn't thought about before. Thank you so much. And I guess kind of touching on that kind of leads me naturally. So William, the exhibition is called You Say You Love Me But You Don't Even Know Me. And we sit here on today, on Valentine's Day, launching this particular show. Could you tell me a little bit about the name and what we kind of hope to achieve together through the exhibition? <coughs> well, well, the title um, was Trevor's uh, brainwave, really, and and uh, we, but we we, we kind of liked it. And it was actually a working title. It was a working title. <laughs> a working could, title that stuck. That worked so well. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, it must have had uh, some uh, inherent merit to it, but um, but I think. You know, it's, it, the context, I think, is right. It's a good time for an exhibition like this in that, um, you know, we're, we've just been, we're coming out of a period where we've been reflecting on centenaries, kind of north and south, and, um, and, 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 the, and, the, and the legacy of kind of the events uh, and what, you know, the processes 100 years ago. Um, we're also kind of dealing with um, the uh, outworkings of, of Brexit, and which I think has, um, you know, not been necessarily helpful in terms of um, uh, you know relationships kind of uh, across the island, and uh, you know I think we're also in a in, in but we're in a, a policy context you might say where shared island is is kind of um, you know being advanced within uh, the Taoiseach's office and in Northern Ireland we are guided by um, new decade, new approach, you know, which put, puts a, a strong emphasis on kind of exploring identities and all, in, in all their diversity and um, the importance of uh, identity and cultural expression. So um, I think in that context, you know, this is a, it's a good time for collaboration like this because um, we do have so much in common, you know, and in terms of uh, uh, you know, everyone that lives here, kind of, um, whether, uh, you know, has a stake in the future of this island. And um, I think anything we can do to um, stimulate kind of conversations, it, it, it is, like I've written a piece, a companion piece for the exhibition called um, uh, Paral Parallel Worlds on a Small Island. And I suppose that my thinking behind that is that I do think often we, we do occupy parallel worlds. I don't think just north and south, but actually kind of much, you know, um, within communities, you know, across communities, you know, there's, 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 there's often um, not as much maybe mutual understanding or exchange of views as, 
as we would need to have in terms of being able to really be, be a bit more sensitive to different viewpoints and a bit more empathetic, perhaps, to just other people's experience, um, you know, their sense of, you know, um, identity and, and their aspirations and also their fears, maybe, and how we kind of, you know, create a, a better space within which, um, you know, we can think creatively about our future. Thank you. And I think one of the things that we, as a people's museum, loved that your team did is that your curators collectively worked on actually looking at and representing different stories different, picking some of their own personal highlights from the collection to bring for display here in the Little Museum. And kind of, Hannah, I'd love you just to talk me through that curatorial process and kind of how your curators actually decided on what pieces they were going to showcase and what stories they were going to tell. Well, I, I manage our team of curators at National Museums, and I and curators are very uh, independent. They're very knowledgeable individuals. Um, they're extremely passionate about their subject areas and about the collections that they're responsible for. Um, so to an extent, I suppose we wanted to give them that, that freedom to really make those very personal choices. So we didn't put too many parameters um, around the curatorial process. We, we wanted them to select items which for them communicated something about Northern Ireland, um, the place we're from, our collections are from. Um, and we wanted to kind of show um, some of the connections as well, um, North and South, and particularly where possible connections with Dublin, uh, this being the Little Museum of Dublin. Um, and we, we wanted um, to kind of show the full scope of our collections as well. Um, we're responsible for four museums. Uh, we have collections across art history and natural science. Um, and we have around 1.4 million objects in our collection. So a very small selection, 35 of them here, but we wanted to kind of show the diversity of the collections. And um, I suppose we, we're very inspired by the approach that the Little Museum takes um, and there's, there's a lot of humor here even with the quite difficult issues looking at them in a slightly different way sharing different perspectives so we wanted to bring that to the, the collections as well so hopefully there'll be some surprises in the exhibition um, and just encouraging people to see Northern Ireland in a slightly different way. Oh, well as it's your team have just they've been so incredible to work with they really really have and so we're so we're so proud of the exhibition that together we have ultimately curated, which is something I'm sincerely grateful to you all for. Um, and Catherine, part of the work of the National Museum's NI, as kind of, I'm going to quote a kind of a section that William wrote in the introduction to the exhibition, where he's saying, part of your work is trying to make sense of the contested past, the ever-changing present, and the possible futures of Northern Ireland. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how your work or the work of museums generally actually kind of plays a part in forming the future of our societies? Well, and that's very much our vision as an organisation. And I think I'm not a museum professional, so and my colleagues are. They know everything about museums. I'm just an interloper. And it's been a really interesting journey for me to learn about museums, but to see museums as more than just visitor attractions. And actually, the breadth and depth of what we do has such a significant impact on our society. So yes, we generate economic impact in a sense, but we also do huge social impact and also uh, massive environmental impact. And one of the big questions, I'm six years now in my role, and one of the big questions we've been asking ourselves and we continually ask ourselves is, what is the role and purpose of museums in society today? And I think that there's a massive role we can play. Um, we, uh, the collections tell us, yes, about the past, but they also help us to make sense of the world around us, to ask questions. For us in particular at National Museums in Northern Ireland, I think our collections can speak to the legacy of conflict and, and how you deal with that. And I think that's an incredibly important role for us uh, within our society because um, we, have, um, we, have, we have a shared history, but we don't have a shared memory. And everybody has a different lived experience of what um, of what they experienced during some of those, those, those years. And, but we also are uh, very bad at making our past very binary. And um, we, we kind of segregate ourselves in ways that is, doesn't actually speak to the complexity of where we've come from. So um, we're always trying to uh, 
be brave and to challenge through some of the objects we put in display and through some of the questions that we ask. And in that way, we hope that people will come together and that they will debate and discuss and, um, and that they will help then to think about what that means for the future. We had a, a great exhibition last year, particularly on partition. And um, it was, yes, it reflected on the events around 100 years ago, but it also um, very much looked at the legacy of conflict and what does it mean for us today and, and on our collective role in building a, a better future. Well, thank you. And I think kind of one of the things that came across to, to me when looking at the exhibition is kind of something you touched on there is this idea of identity and I guess with new apologies I'm going to quote you a few times today um, and it's very quotable <laughs> I noticed I that I use his best lines all the time <laughs> yes I am um, what's mine is yours <laughs> <laughs> well then I'm just borrowing <laughs> Actually, that's, that ties into the theme of today. Um, but in that, um, in that piece, you also wrote that the work of the National Museum's NI is simultaneously local and international while supporting debate around questions of national and other identities. And I'd love you just to reflect for a second on how the idea of identities and how the approach to this kind of informs the work in the museum. Well, I think one of the... We're, we're interested in um, the challenge of uh, how do we confront stereotypes. Um, it's, it's actually a recurring theme, you know, because I think as a, as a society, I think it's a global issue. Like it's not, you know, nobody uh, has a monopoly on it, you know, but, but stereotyping people and it is very, um, I think, destructive in terms of really building up a kind of a genuine understanding. And, you know, actually, the Elston Museum, sometimes Northern Ireland, uh, you know, has been seen as a bit trapped in its past and, and kind of, um, you know, and in, in truth, the Elston Museum, and National Museum is Northern Ireland, but I'll give the example of the Elston Museum, has been, has always been very international in its outlook. You know, it's not in any way kind of provincial in that sense. It's always been very ambitious in terms of, you know, the, the collection, um, the kind of how we want, how, how the museum can open up perspectives kind of on not you know on who we are but also not just in this island but our place in the world you know we you know we collect internationally like we come from you know we're from part of Ireland where there's very little consensus on issues of nationality or <coughs> what it means to be Irish or what it means to be British or all sorts of things kind of besides and and you can either see that as a problem or you can see it as a as an opportunity and we always see it as an opportunity because, you know, I think it's important to be able to debate, you know, to be able to reflect on things that are very local, very much kind of, you know, kind of reflect that are meaningful to communities and to kind of, but also to kind of to be able to, you know, to frame a lot of the issues that are of, you know, the big challenges, you know, within a much broader international context and to be able to, to think more globally around who we, where we're going and the challenges we face. And then within that, you have national identity and you know that's something that can just be debated you know because I think it does need to be debated it, because it needs to I think be something that evolves you know and um, I think part of the challenge um, for in terms of building shared Ireland is actually building a sort of a very inclusive vision of the future in a sense that actually embraces everybody that lives here because everybody that lives here has a right to be here and has to be embraced within the the total concept of what it is to you know within a shared island so that's i think a, that is a good challenge but i think it's one that um you know sometimes um you know i think we do on to all of us to, to a greater or lesser extent sometimes sit in echo chambers you know and i think the world that we live in, especially now with social media, you know, where it's so kind of can be so, you know, tw Twitter is a very kind of trigger happy kind of medium. And, you know, it's not necessarily helpful at times in terms of really, you know, building relationships. And, but I think that's where museums can do have a really important role, you know, and, and, and when it comes to more contentious are more challenging issues, you know, we're, we're, we're a safe space for unsafe conversations maybe, you know, where that might be difficult else, you know, and, and maybe sometimes we're 
one of the few <coughs> places, one of the few spaces where people can come together and kind of uh, explore, um, you know, sometimes quite challenging issues. Yeah, a safe place for challenging conversations. That's a, that's a beautifully put sentence. And I guess that kind of, that plays into kind of questioning what a museum is and, you know, kind of, Hannah, I know one of the hats that you wear is that you're on the committee with ICOM, which is the kind of the Museums Council, um, the International Museums Council. And I, I guess kind of within that, I'd be curious if you'd reflect on, say, the role of a city museum, a national museum, community museum, and kind of where we all kind of exist together. Well, I suppose it's interesting you say that I, I wear a number of different hats, and I think we, we all do in our, in our lives, but I think uh, museums wear a number of different hats as well. And, and again, to use something like the, the Ulster <coughs> Museum as, as an example, um, it, it does function as a city museum, and we, we want it to be a place that kind of local people can, can feel pride in, that they can feel that it connects with them and that they can come to. But um, we, we do have a role as, as a national museum as well. We do have a role as, a, as an international museum. And so I suppose it's recognising that um, there's those different layers in, in museums. And it is undoubtedly a challenge for us, but we do strongly believe that museums are for everyone. Um, and we want them to be welcoming and inclusive spaces for everyone. So through our programming, through our collections, through our communications, we have to work hard to prove that um, and to be able to show what we can offer um, at those different levels. And I think something like uh, ICOM, which is the International Council of Museums, is, is really important because um, we, we kind of have a lot of shared goals, shared interests. Um, the pandemic, it's been devastating um, in, in many ways, of course. I think for museums, it's been an extremely challenging time. And feeling part of that interconnected global network um, and <coughs> being able to kind of share those challenges and kind of share solutions as well and, and, and opportunities. Um, so I think it's just recognizing that, that museums are more complex than probably a lot of people imagine and we, we all have our own view of, of museums uh, and it's how can we be as inclusive as possible to those those different views and those different functions. Thank you and I kind of in terms of talking about giving space for different views, um, Catherine I think this is the timing of this exhibition is particularly well placed in the context of the conversations that are ongoing but also looking at, say, the uh, centenaries that are actively in progress. And it kind of, I'd, I'd love you to reflect a little bit on, I guess, the role that a partnership like this has within your organization, but also kind of more generally on the types of conversations that you hope are going to be triggered as a result of this project. Yeah, and, and I know this was delayed and it's been perfect because I think this is an absolutely perfect time for this exhibition to be here and for this conversation to, to happen. And I suppose from our perspective, partnership is uh, increasingly important to us. We can achieve an awful lot more through partnership. We can achieve a lot more where we, particularly where we have partners whose values are aligned to our values and who are trying to um, achieve the same objectives as, as we are, because you have your own audience here at the Little Museum of Dublin. Probably they'll never, or they may never come up to Belfast or visit us, but uh, the opportunity for us to bring um, our, our collection and, and, our, and our, our, I guess, our questions to a new audience. And that's what partnership, I think, is so important for and so um, uh, and, and collaborating in lots of different ways. We're going to hopefully visit the National Museum of Ireland tomorrow. I think there's other conversations that we can have um, across the island. We're particularly interested in working with them around our um, natural science collections. I think collectively we we, uh, we can tell the, the history of the natural landscape of biodiversity here in the island and that can really help to um, uh, answer questions and ask questions around climate change and where we're going. And so I think we're quite um, excited with that, that as well. And I think your, your reach and your impact is so much greater when you work with partners and that's why it's really important to us. Yeah, and the, um, the getting to know our neighbours sentiment is one that we're particularly fond of and I guess kind of in that vein kind of I wonder Catherine would you take a minute to just tell us about your own journey to the National Museums? Um, 
my own journey to the National Museums. Well, it, it's not, I've never, it's not, I suppose for me personally, I've never been a career planner, so it kind of happened upon everything in, in my life. And I went to uh, university in Edinburgh. I didn't, uh, my career advice at school was extremely limited. I didn't want to be a doctor, a, dirt, a dentist, an engineer, or an architect. And so um, I went to do a business studies degree because I didn't really want to study any of the subjects I was doing at A-levels. And I was really just going for a life. And, um, and I had a great time in Edinburgh. But um, and, and I did start doing a business and accountancy degree, but accountancy meant you had to turn up to your nine o'clock lectures, and I wasn't very good at that, so I stopped going to accountancy. But ironically, when I left university, I did end up training with Price Waterhouse to be an accountant. So I am an accountant, which is very unusual to be in the role that I'm in as an accountant, but I am. I, years of therapy has allowed me to say that in public, and. Um, <laughs> I suppose from there I, I worked within the health service in Glasgow and then I came home to Northern Ireland and I worked within Tourism NI which gave me uh, or started to give me a real understanding of I suppose the museums are, are parts, they, it's like a Venn diagram, there are parts of overlap within that and I think it was just the right time for me when the, this particular rule came up at the museums and I thought well that thinks that that could be really good and it's been brilliant I, I I honestly have the best job in the world and I work with the best people in the world not just those that are here but um, there's an incredible team of people that work with me across our four museum sites um, we have uh, it's a real privilege and, and an honour to be the custodians of the national collection for Northern Ireland but it's also a huge responsibility and um, we do take that responsibility really seriously and that's why um, we're always trying to push ourselves to do more and better and to ensure that we do uh, uh, fulfill, fulfill the potential of what we can do within society. So that's really how I ended up where I am today. And I don't think I'm going to be moving on anytime soon because it's just too good. It's too much fun. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful thing? It really is. And it's, um, I think, actually, very fortunately, we have a, we have a journey up to, um, for a day trip to come visit your museums Brilliant. in the next couple of weeks, which we are looking forward to and more to, more to follow on that. But um, one of the things that when I was thinking about today and preparing, there was part of me that was very aware of the fact that I'm a 30-something Dubliner who's a second-generation dub who didn't grow up through many of the events that we are talking about over the, over the course of my lifetime. And so I do often find myself in conversations where I don't say anything because I'm terrified to say the wrong thing or to have an opinion because it may not be fully informed. And I think if our goal through this exhibition is to have conversations and to kind of begin those narratives, I wonder, I guess maybe William, you might reflect on how do we approach that challenge of empowering people to have conversations and to gain access to views that are perhaps different to their own? Well, I think it comes down to uh, if museums, if you imagine a museum as a person, you know, and what kind of what kind of personality would you want your museum to have? And I think one of the things that um, is, I think, the reasons why the, that the museum is so successful is because it, 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 there's a warmth, and uh, you know, you're, you feel welcome, and you feel that. This is a conversational, you know. You deal with you deal with serious, complex history, but you do you also have a sense of humour, and those are all the kind of things that, you know, if you were to take a, a museum out, you know, for dinner or kind of thing, you'd want a museum that actually has some, you know, that's kind of conversational, you know, has some warmth and kind of has a sense of humour kind of thing. And I think that's, I think when museums are probably. Um, you know that that's that's when museums are at their best. I think you know we need to be, uh, you know, welcoming places. I think we need to be able to put people at their ease. We need to kind of be actually quite open ourselves and say, look, we don't have all the answers. You know, it's not like, you know, you, you know, we, we might know a bit about this and that. You know, but actually, we 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 have to see it as a, you know, we're all on a journey. Like I know it's that in some ways is a bit of a cliche, but it's actually also a very powerful metaphor I think we are all on a journey and as a society we're on a journey but we're all on our own individual journeys as well and I think um, uh, you know so I think it's about you know you know ma making 
people feel confident about asking questions and actually that because you know that's what we do we're con we're always asking questions you know ourselves because we and we don't always know the answer you know so it's kind of um, not knowing the answer and not kind of necessarily being that confident you know it's something i think museums almost need to i think be more open about the fact that we are you know we're we're all kind of trying to make sense of the world we live in and we're all trying to sort of you know uh, work out how do we create the sort of future that we'd that we'd like to see, and we, we're, we're all trying to. We want, um, you know, we want our society to be stable and people to feel respected, and you know, and, and to uh, whatever their background or sort of our, our our kind of identity. It's we, you know, we need to kind of everybody should feel a a warm embrace, if you know what I mean. And 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 I think um, I think that's really the. Those are the kind of values I think that we need to kind of permeate, you know, our, our organisations in terms of how we how we work, how we and how we how we work with 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 our partners, how we work with the public. You know, the um, the the sentiment of if the little museum was a dinner party guest, it would be invited. Is uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely on the list. Oh, that's a very sweet one. I love it. So thank you. Um, like we like to think we turn up with a big carryout. You know, <laughs> you know. I think after the last couple of years, we're all in need of a good party. So I'm totally okay with that. Um, and then kind of, Hannah, one of the things that is talked about in the museum world and indeed kind of in society more generally is the kind of the legacy of colonialism in museums and kind of, I understand it's something that you've kind of written about a bit and I'd love you to just share your thoughts on the direction that you think we're headed. Yeah, it, it, it's certainly a very topical issue um, in museums and indeed beyond, as you, you've said. And in many ways, that's a good thing because what we want of our museums is we, we want them to be relevant. We want them to help people engage with and, and understand um, contemporary issues. So in many ways, it's, it's an opportunity to us. I think what's been slightly problematic, as I would see it, is the way it has been portrayed in the media. Um, sometimes you'll see it under the banner of um, repatriation, for example. Sometimes you'll see it under the banner of, certainly in the UK, the culture wars. Um, and it can become very oversimplified, very reductive. And in doing so, I think it actually becomes quite divisive and even toxic, I would say. And that is really unhelpful for us. Uh, I think it's unhelpful in museums generally, but particularly when you're a museum in Northern Ireland, so much of your work is about greater nuance and kind of promoting understanding, uh, uh, helping support good relations. So we've slightly tried to turn it on its head and we, we have, we'd have around 4,500 objects in our collections that we'd term world cultures. Um, and beyond that, in our natural sciences collections, we have material from around the world. In our art collection, we have international art. Um, but these collections, they, there are some difficult issues inherent in them, um, and some of them are kind of a result of the very negative aspects of colonialism, and we, we're not afraid of calling those out and dealing with those, and there are certain things we, we need to do to address that. But some of them just reflect much more kind of our global networks, our partnerships around the world. Um, we recognise that in Northern Ireland, indeed anywhere, that not everyone who, who lives there is kind of can trace their history way back. We, we are a society that's very diverse and we see those collections as being a good opportunity to kind of raise awareness, um, to help people who are from different cultures to feel part of the museums, to be able to see their faces in there. Um, so we, we kind of frame this um, in terms of what we would call inclusive global histories. Um, and it, it kind of then aligns with all our work, which again is that kind of showing multiple perspectives, understanding that there's different realities of life both in the past and today, um, and helping kind of encourage greater empathy, greater respect, uh, and, and greater understanding. So I say difficult as some of the issues are, um, mindful as we are of our ethical responsibilities, which guide us in absolutely everything we do. Um, we, we do want to promote this much more positive and inclusive approach than you would probably see in the media. Thank you. And I think, Catherine, a minute ago, you, you mentioned that you come from kind of the tourism background as well as kind of now coming into the museum world. And I kind of wonder, as we're coming through the pandemic and hopefully towards the next kind of 
chapter in uh, world history. I, I kind of wonder what, when you think about the future of museums, visitor attractions, and the kind of the wider industry, um, what's your hope or what's your vision of what's to come? I actually think that, it, I suppose for us at National Museums and I, we've, We've, we have been on somewhat of a journey before COVID came along and, and we talk a lot internally about the fact we're transforming ourselves as an organisation because we have to think differently about who we are, what we do, how we do it, um, how we become and make sure we're the museums for everyone, as, as Hannah said, because museums do have perception problems and we had done a lot of research that um, showed us the challenges there were and how, uh, you know, the parts of our population that weren't visiting our museums and so... For us, um, COVID has actually been a bit of a, the pandemic's been a bit of a catalyst because it's actually helped us to move faster than we might necessarily have been able to. It's a time when everybody, and, and including ourselves, have had to think uh, much more agilely, much more flexibly about how we do to adapt and, and change. And I think the biggest challenge for us going forward will be to make sure we don't lose the really good things that we have, have learned in the process and automatically revert back to where we were before. But I think more broadly, the pandemic has really caused people to stop and think and to think about how they spend their time, to think about the things in life that really matter to them, to make sense of who they are, to uh, reconnect um, uh, to the things that really matter in life. I think there's, an, there's you know, we saw the, the, the strength of community and um, supporting local and buying local. And I think within that whole space, uh, museums have a significant role to play and we can actually be the place that reconnects people to those kind of things in life. So I see that coming out of the pandemic, we will be even more relevant than we were before. And, uh, and the challenge for us is to keep pace and to make sure that, our, that we are investing in our spaces and in our places to make sure that the functionality of what we have is able to support the way that people want to come and engage with museums. <coughs> People can access content everywhere. They can do a lot of it from their sofa, you know, Netflix, YouTube, online. And so they're coming to museums for very different experiences. They want to have much more participative experiences. They want to come and get involved in the life of museums. And um, volunteering is going to be uh, increasingly more important for us going forward. So those are all the, the opportunities that I think that we can create um, meaningful and purposeful uh, things that, uh, and ways for people to spend their, their spare time. So I'm actually quite excited about the future. I think it's our moment. It sounds like community's at the heart of it. Yes, very much. I think, and, and I suppose from a tourism perspective and, and, and having worked in tourism, I think that the most important thing for us to do as to museums is to be relevant for our local communities and our local um, uh, population. And uh, if people want to come and engage with us, it will create an authenticity around what we do. And I think that that is inherently the most attractive thing that there is for international visitors. Yeah, do the thing the locals want to do. Absolutely. And I guess kind of... The, the thing that the local wants in exactly that sentiment. Like, William, when you look at the exhibition on display here in the Little Museum, I wonder what's the piece that you are happiest to see in one of our cases around the wall and why? Uh, <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, actually. Um, uh, I'm almost tempted to say the portrait of Edward Carson just because it's the first... We acquired it last year and... Uh, it's the first time I've actually seen it myself, kind of, and and I think you know he's a very interesting and I think often misunderstood or oversimplified political figure, and you know has a very strong Dublin connection, and um, you know so Carson's coming home in that sense, you know, which is uh, um, and I think when you you know consider how he's immortalised in bronze at the front of Parliament buildings, you know, which is in a it's almost a freeze frame of that captures one part of his personality, but kind of then negates all the other more complex parts, but um, are maybe even more sympathetic, you know, in the terms of his, you know, his uh, sort of emotional life, etc. But, but I think I would have to say, um, just because partly, you know, just to declare my own, my uh, sort of personal interest, the James Young album, um, it belonged to my parents and um, I donated it to the museum kind of a few years ago. Kind of, I, I wasn't insistent that it, uh, that, that it was accepted. I didn't, didn't lobby kind of um, on, 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 on my own behalf. But, um, but James Young, <clears throat> I, I grew up, it was like, it takes me back to my 70s childhood. And 
Um, you know, I grew up on a sort of, uh, my father was a farmer, my mum was a teacher, and um, they had a sort of a, a record collection that, um, you know, and I, the only albums that I actually listened to were the James Young albums, and I was never a fan of Acker Bilk or uh, mm. Jim Reeves um, or, or the Dubliners, although I know there's a strong case to be made for the Dubliners, but um, so I kind of listened and was fascinated by James Young albums because I'd never been to theatre and, you know, it was not a time in Northern Ireland when kind of so socially it was so kind of restricted in the 70s, you know, just because of the trouble. So it was transporting me to a different world that I never actually experienced myself, the group theatre. And I've, you know, we've talked a lot about stereotypes and the importance of challenging stereotypes, yet James Young is all about stereotypes. Like his whole, his whole repertoire was a series of all Northern Ireland, Belfast stereotypes. Like it was like the, the Paddy Raff of his day, you know, and, um, and it's whilst the album is behind the barricades and it has James Young and Dragon, there's a sort of a barricade and then there's a soldier on the other side of the barricade and James Young is kind of, you know, engaging the... Like, it's not my favourite album, but it is a, it's my favourite album cover. And, but it, there's a poignancy also to James Young in the sense that, you know, he, he kind of, you know, he died in 1974, but he had a period where his performance overlapped with the, some of the darkest years of the Troubles. And he was always performing to a kind of a, a cross-community audience. And, you know, I think humour is one of those things that actually is so essential to how people deal with often when, you know... You know, when society was kind of going through these kind of convulsions and, and all of the kind of the, the terrible things that were actually happening in that period, you know, humor is one of the ways that people cope often with, with difficulty. And, you know, and he always ended his performances with um, stop fighting. It was, uh, you know, implored the audience kind of thing. And so I think just for that reason, because it's kind of its personal. Um, and it's tied up, you know, with memories of my own childhood and memories of my, my father in particular. And, uh, and also, in some ways, it does say something, I think, quite important that's often overlooked about the Troubles, which is actually how people coped in very difficult times and, and, and the ter determination, I think, of people to try to get on with their lives amidst, you know, a very fraught, in a very fraught situation. And I think that's one of the things we're always keen to to surface in terms of the interpretation we place on troubles and conflict is actually to try to find the stories that are, the voices that are maybe less heard, the perspectives often that are less heard, mm -hmm. and that actually kind of people that ref reflect often just how society adjusted and how people cope with diff in a very difficult situation. Two of the words we really try to find in this building are, I remember. So hearing your own personal reflections, I'm really proud that we get to share that with guests. But I guess that kind of brings the formal element of today to a close. And to the three of you, sincerely, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and to have a conversation. It's a partnership that has been a long time in the making, it must be said. Uh, we're so immensely proud to be working with yourselves and your colleagues. And over the next three months, between now and the 6th of June, to have the opportunity to have all of our guests come in to explore the exhibition, to have conversations and to give it, you know, to give it the time and consideration it really deserves. So sincerely, thank you all so, so much and to the Department of Foreign Affairs and to the Esme Mitchell Trust for making it possible, of course. We really very much appreciate that and to all of you for being here today. Thank you so much for attending the first in-person Little Museum of Dublin event in almost two years. So William, Catherine, Hannah, thank you all thank you. so, so much and thank you all. <laughs>